putting together the best ways of people and in a small room and everybody who is relying on like our current system is in the city, I guess, um, there are more opportunities than on the countryside because then it's, it's more, there's more details in, in the city than in a landscape because there you have just the basic stuff. I had a funny, uh, uh, interesting conversation yesterday with a guy from, from, from Israel, a good friend of mine, and he was telling me about this new movement. People, especially here, we don't have this rich country like, um, like Germany is. Like people get, it doesn't get paid that well from the, uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, this Kurzarbeit or whatever that doesn't exist here. And there's a big movement. People can't afford the high rents anymore. They're moving out to the uh, to the kibbutz here. So, thinking of Israel, does this does sound like a kibbutz? Is that is that the model, or is it different? I don't know enough about kibbutzes. Oh, I guess as I learned yesterday, the kibbutzim are very strong related to um, to co communism. So it's all about the we and not about the I. So you just give away your kids. To houses where that gets grazed and so on, everything is belonging to the community. I guess that's not what we are thinking of. So it's not a, it's a very uh, strong ideology in this kibbutzim. That's why they failed so badly. In the end, when money came in, they just went um, crazy because they just get anxious about the the other kibbutzim around that said, okay, maybe they just um, steal our inventions, which is like this dripping water stuff which this is where they're famous for. And once their money came in, some of them get really, got really rich and some of them went bank bankruptcy and it was really like a trauma here. So everybody's talking about, but now there's a removal or revival. People go back because they like this, it's, it's cheaper. They like these small communities and the, the, the nature. But of course you're missing also something. It's not that it's the ideal world because people are coming back to the city, especially artists or whatever, and say, it's so harmonic in the nature outside. So I need the city to get something like tension or something. Yeah. So, but it's a, but it's a very, yeah, how you say it? it's, it's, it's a, I'm not quite sure if it will last this way. Like if we need the city or if it's just, we are used to it and we know that there are some advantages out of it, but there are a lot of disadvantages also. Like you have to, work a lot to oh, yeah. pay the end. Yeah. Make ends meet. Yeah. I'm just just picking up because you know I, I'm old and I, I forget things quickly. But while I, something you said, um, you know, the whole thing about trying to create a perfect structure and bringing people in from the old structure. I mean, I'm thinking of Brazil and I'm thinking of Brasilia. I don't know if you've been to Brasilia, <laughs> um, but I, I was there some years ago and I was very struck because the idea, and I'd read about it before, the idea was to have the perfect community, to have equality, to have um, this artificial lake, and to have, you know, A, B, C, D, E, shaped like an airplane wing, and it was all very fanciful. Um, and, and that was, and to get away from the ugliness of Sao Paulo and, and, and all of that, and, and, and try to and move the capital there, and a very, very big idea, a lot of and then you go there and, you know, and it, when I went, it was in the early 80s, and I think it had only been there in existence about 10 years, I think, or 60s, 60s or 70s it was. And already, you know, one side of the lake was more fashionable than the other side of the lake. Um, people were trying to rename streets um, to, for identities. I mean, there's a very deep need in people to, um, to have a hierarchy, um, I find, and which is unfortunate, but, uh, but the whole idea of the communal, um, existence in a in a perfect world just wasn't working because and they were flying to Rio as quickly as they could to be on the beach and have sex and drink and all of that so it was sort of an artificial construct that made sense in in heads but the human being didn't do that and I'm, I'm thinking also of Dostoevsky um, one of my favorite authors um, uh, who and I, I've forgotten this is in notes from the underground if you've read it um, something about, and I mean, he was reacting to the Crystal Palace, which was built in the 19th century in, in, in London. They were saying, we're going to have a perfect Crystal Palace demonstrating everything it was at the exposition World Fair. And he said, but when you have a Crystal Palace um, that is perfect, man will come in and destroy it simply because he must. 
uh, you know, that there's, there's, a, there's an urge in people, an irrational urge to freedom and to rebellion and to, uh, and that people don't want to be in a perfect place. They want to, you know, do something, you can call it destructive or they want to strike it. I've forgotten the exact quote, but I was very um, taken by it when I, when I read it, this, this deep seated need to express yourself, to not fit in, to be a rebel. Uh, and the people in history that I admire the most, and maybe your question, well, who am I, um, are rebels, you know, people that, 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 that go against the grain. I'm thinking of uh, Arthur Rimbaud, the, the, the famous poet um, who uh, went to Ethiopia and ran guns and did all kinds of funny things and died at 33, but wrote the most stunning poetry I've ever read. Um, but he was a rebel. He absolutely refused. You know, he was, uh, he was gay. He was... Um, you know, he lived in Ethiopia. He, had, he did all sorts of terrible things by the standards of the times, but he, left, he lived a very rich life. Or I'm thinking a little more conventionally of Hannah Arendt. Uh, I'm reading some stuff about her right now. I mean, all her life, you know, she, she never really had a job. She didn't, wasn't a professor. She didn't pay her dues to the academic community. She, was, she did what she wanted. She didn't like Zionism. She didn't like communism. She didn't like um, uh, capitalism. She, she was utterly um, against everyone, and she had a very sharp tongue, and she, uh, but she is remembered as the, one of the major figures of the century. Um, so this standing up against the ideal, this, this, you call it irrational, this, this rebellious, that's strong in me as well. Um, so I, I, I would have trouble in a community like that, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I, I can, I can, before we go into um, you dreaming up um, the community that you would like to build, um, given your knowledge and um, your, um, your, your feelings, um, I'd like to give you a little way out of, um, of, of that, of that problem. There's, um, there's some, um, there's a structure that appears to be a structure to um, nomadic tribes. You can see that's in, in today's nomadic tribes and um, apparently also um, with some tricks of archeology, span you can see that in, in, uh, in, in past um, nomadic tribes. And that is, <clears throat> there's four types types of um, people um, and they cluster together in, and, and they serve an important function each. So there's, there's one central big cluster, about 45% of the population that is, <clears throat> that constitutes the internal um, culture. Then there's another big cluster um, around that, um, also 45%, that constitutes um, smaller, smaller groups that are more outward bound, that want to explore, fight, hunt, um, build, um, experiment, and do new things. <clears throat> These two are bound together by a um, smaller group of 5% that has the capacity to communicate between the inward oriented and the outward oriented. And all of that is held together by another ring of 5%. And these are the <clears throat> ones who are able to communicate with entirely other groups of people. <clears throat> so these, <clears throat> these are the shamans, the diplomats, um, the crazy ones. These are the ones that. Yeah. Thomas, is this Thomas Schindler's view of the world, or where did you get this? This is very interesting. No, that's. This... Um, I first got that from Alexander Bard. Um, mm -hmm. He did some research into that, um, mm -hmm. uh, but there's others that that mirror this um, configuration. So this is um, not my invention. No. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> so. Um, I don't know if that's correct, but it makes a lot of sense to me. And um, from what you described, um, you are more in this shamanic area. Um, 
the modern version of a sh shaman is a diplomat. Um, so um, the one that is capable of um, communicating across borders of communities. Yeah. Right. So, so um, from a from the perspective of the what of our conversation here, what we're looking for is um, these kinds of explorations into how to build culture. Um, we don't. Um, we want to go down to the to the to the first principles as far as we can of what it means to be a group of humans working together, um, and then let it grow from there. Um, so we we really don't aren't interested in in ideologies like whatever communism, <laughs> capitalism. Um, it, we know or we, we all we want to do is we want to provide a framework of how to create healthy communities for when it's needed right so so from from that perspective uh and from your experience with um uh, helping people through play um to navigate themselves their world um, i'd be very interested in how you would map what you know onto a community of people who find themselves um, somewhere in the outback disconnected from the rest of society or rest of civilization rest of the species having to feed themselves um, and what's your intuition of what you would do in that situation or would they really be cut off i mean the idea is yes there's no more internet there's no more phones there's no more it's all self-sufficient right and they're they're like uh, 500 kilometers off somewhere in the jungle um and they were brought there by a bunch of helicopters and now they're there so mm -hmm. and there's nobody they have no connection anywhere else in the world no and their former family is gone uh, exactly. I, or whatever. That's a thought experiment. So either gone or somewhere else, but but there's no connection. You they, they, you have to somehow be it's together. Perfect. You are there. And, okay. Yeah. So it's an extreme thought experiment. True, no, but um, uh, but but it helps us um, set some set up some boundaries. Well, I mean, I would say I think one of the most fundamental human needs is connection. Absolutely, I think people absolutely, and there have been all sorts of things. I mean, there was this wonderful TED talk about from Harvard that you might you must know about what makes the the happy life, the the long life, the good life. There was this I forgot the name of the guy, but they did an experiment at Harvard. They followed the class of 1924. Have you seen this? Or uh, sure. over 40 years or 50? Uh, it's look it up. I, I'll I'll send you the link if I can find mm -hmm. it. Please and do. they wanted to know what is the what makes a good life. What is the most important thing in life? And so they followed this class. Um, I think from the 20s all the way up to 50 years later to see what happened to everybody. Mm -hmm. And they did a lot of empirical work and, you know, some, you know, moved up and became famous and uh, or, or wealthy and others moved down and some committed suicide and some, you know, had a boring middle class life and everyone did different things. And then they measured the success and I don't know what quite how they measured success, which is a certainly a good question. But they found that the absolute number one thing that made people live a good life was relationships with others uh, and connection with others. And that's the, that trump, trumps everything else. Um, uh, and so how do you do that if you're 150 people in the outback? I mean, you've got to do something that brings people together, that makes them connect. Um, and play is certainly one thing that I, I firmly believe people have a deep need to play. Um, in my own TED, Talks, TED Talk, I talked about that as well, that this urge to play is greater than the urge to fight. Um, so I think the Spieltrieb uh, is very, very deep. And, you know, that, that can be, um, uh, you know, energized, can be tapped into. Uh, it brings joy, it brings pleasure, it brings connection. So I would, if I were helping to organize this, I would certainly want a lot of play, especially if it's so perfect. You know what I mean? You know, it's got to be. There's got to be some outlet for irrationality, for 
um, for um, joy, for uh, spontaneity, uh, and that you get that in play. So yes, I don't know quite what, how you would do it. I, I'm assuming you don't have any of the digital stuff anymore and you don't have much materials and you don't have, um, you don't have footballs and basketballs and, and all that stuff. I mean, you have to create anything you want. You have to create locally. Exactly. You know? But I, I, can, I can see create, people creating balls out of um, plants, so. Well, that's one thing, speaking of play, you know, one thing that, you know, you know from child development is, and I don't have children, so this is secondhand, but is um, there's a stage in child development between four and eight, they say, where children play naturally and they know they're playing, um, which is important. So they'll pick up a banana and say, this is a telephone and they'll play like it's tough, but they know it's a banana. They're not deceived. And they're, they're, there's the, what we call the magic circle in play therapy. It's, you know, where's reality? Reality's out here and this is my play world, but I'm aware of where the, where the grenze is, where the border is. Um, and so children can play with anything. They play with their toes, they play with bananas, they play with whatever they find and they're delighted by it. So they don't need a PlayStation and they don't need, you know, um, all sorts of help for that. So you go back to that, I guess, playing with your toes. I'd like, I'd like to put in a very specific question here now um, related to that. So do you know the concept of the innovator's dilemma? The which dilemma? Innovator's dilemma. Oh, tell me more. So as soon as a group of people um, solve as a problem or a set of problems, um, they, they tend to um, crystallize, they tend to rigidify. And you see that in, in companies who cannot um, in, innovate the, their way out of that trap anymore, so they get overtaken by a, disrupt, a disruptor in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this, is, this is very natural because if something works, you want to protect it, um, but um, <clears throat> you usually um, don't, you get blind to the moment where the environment changes to an extent that you should be changing your program. <clears throat> so um, the reaction to that, um, so I, I once had an, a small opportunity to, to um, speak with Elon and I, Elon Musk and I asked him so once you're on Mars and you're establishing your your civilization there you need some rules what what are the most important design principles for your civilization and he said every rule that we set up is has a sunsetting period which means it'll after a certain set amount of time it'll become um, it, it'll it'll go away, it'll delete itself, unless it's actively reinforced. Um, I know somebody in the, um, in, in, the, in the Game B community who is setting up or helping setting up company, and that company has a limited time of life. It's limited to five years. After that, the company ceases to exist for that same reason, the same logic. There's another experiment in that direction. It's also the same idea in fundraising. Most funders have a window. We will fund you for three years or five, and then we want you to find someone else so that you don't have that. You don't have this, this rot, this static, you know, dependence. Exactly. So, so that's, that's, a, that's another way to, to, to play with this. So um, what, I, what I ask myself um, is how can we institute this... Um, the, this, this imago process, the chrysalis, the total dissolving of all rules um, to consciously recreate um, a new set of rules, let's say on a yearly basis, and this, create this magic circle space that you just um, referred to. So um, I, I, I'd, I'm really curious of um, how you would go about um, ritualizing something like this in a community? Um, it's, you know, I start every seminar that I teach with ground rules. 
Mm -hmm. Which sometimes take people aside, they think, what is this all about? But I say, so before we start, what are our ground rules? And I always, the first one is everyone's responsible for their own learning. I'm not here to, 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 to look after you. You're here because you chose to be here and you, and you decided you want to learn. Then we do silly things, I mean, prosaic things like turn your phone off and don't smoke and, and you know, be on time and, and then whatever they come up with. And, I, and then the, the next thing I say, well, if it's your set, and I say, take ownership of this, then you set the ground rules. That throws them, especially on Zoom, because they don't know what to do. Um, and, then, um, and then we have a list of ground rules. And then I say, uh, by the way, this is a great way to start a negotiation is to talk about ground rules, talk about how we're going to work together. And then they say, oh, OK which is really true. I mean, I can, the bad experiences I've had in negotiation have been when you didn't have ground rules and people violated them and played dirty tricks and things. And you can deal with that a lot. So I'm a great believer in, in ground rules and knowing what game are we playing uh, and what are the rules of that game? And do we want to keep playing that game or another game? You obviously know James Carr's Finite mm -hmm. and Infinite Games. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the same idea. Um, so all of that is in a little seminar, but you know, in a community of 150 people, I think you could certainly have a meeting uh, between uh, leaders that uh, annually talk about ground rules. No, I mean I don't know. Wouldn't be, would it be all 150? That's the Athenian democracy model, that everyone has a voice. Uh, is that possible with 150? You said we can have up to 150 relationships. You said so. Maybe that's enough, that would be work. Or do you have representative? Do 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 you have ten people that decide and they rotate? You know, holacracy. They they rotate every year and it's different people. Different things you can do too. When I when I when this this um, image first popped up um, for me, um, I had a strong association with the carnival in Cologne. Mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced that? Uh, not up close. I don't think so. No. But I, I, you. Yeah. So. So what happens there is that for three days um, or something like that, everybody gets really drunk and they do a lot of stuff they otherwise shouldn't and wouldn't. By cutting people's ties off, I've heard. And that's yeah, the idea behind. Um, I've, 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 I've had to uh, step Very over rough. people having sex on, um, on, on stairs to the cellar and stuff like that. So Nobody it's, minds, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, and, and people having, uh, yeah, doing all sorts of stuff, whatever. <laughs> Um, so they're playing, they're trying. They're playing. Yeah, yeah they're, they're having one. It's, it's, it's like a chrysalis, right? The, the caterpillar has dissolved. They're doing whatever they want. And they might emerge um, out of that in a new relationship or something like that, or a new role. <clears throat> Happens. Um, children have been created there. Um, right. And um, so, and at the end of it all, um, they have this figure that they burn. And that figure um, is a symbol for all of the sins that happened. So it's an it's a enormous um, pressure Cathartic. release valve. Cathartic, yeah, I would say. Yeah. So that's, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking of, um, or uh, I, was, I, I was thinking of. So... Um, I mean, that's obviously embedded in the culture. <laughs> um, but now the question would be how to create a safe space where people can explore themselves uh, to, 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 to the maximum range possible without hurting each other. Just one word to this um, carnival thing. I guess the, the interesting thing about it is that it gets so the whole thing is about forgetting the rules you're in all year for three days. And this is a very playful approach. So you have a rule, rule set, and you know, you're playing these rules all of the year, and then you have three days off where you can just, yeah, be out of it. And this call it like the fifth season or something, right? So and everything what happens inside this, you have to burn afterwards and you're going to forget and nobody's judging you about this. And this is very interesting. And mm -hmm. what I've read about it, it's exactly this way, how to like keep people inside strict rules, which were stricter when they started this kind of carnival. Um, because then they have something like, yeah, a, a safe space where you can just go out of it and then you can, can go back to normal. When you come back, that's when you have your annual meeting with new ground rules. Now that yeah. we've all paid and we're all dissolved, now we can 
appoint people and we'll have a new set of ground rules for this year. So maybe it's the end of year bash. Um, I, question, I mean, is there, has, is there any real damage done at Fushing? I mean, do people die? Does it, I mean, is it, is it all? Sometimes wild? people freeze to death, yes. Um, uh, um, because they're just too drunk and, and fall asleep somewhere in the street. Um, and, um, and then there's, mm -hmm. sorry? The dangerous ritual. So that in a way, go. yes. And, um, and then, um, yeah, people get, uh, people get pregnant. Um, I think, uh, I mean, the, the main damage is probably emotional because um, uh, several relationships get uh, damaged at least. So, um, and maybe, yeah, uh, some, maybe sometimes a, a, a car gets a broken window or something like that, but nothing serious. Well, so it's, it's, this hält sich in Grenzen. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's free flow and it doesn't really leave lasting damage. That's an important thing. So, you know, um, we can do that, you know, we can survive, you know, we don't lose. I mean, I'm thinking of this thing, maybe it doesn't fit with, the Flüchtlinge at the Cologne Bahnhof that were molesting all the women on New Year's Eve, I think it was. I mean, that sort of thing. If, if you open the gates to that and people are desperate and they're, you know, they're, you know, that, that you know, starts to get ugly. Um, or the, or, excuse me, but the um, Capitol riot, these really, really scary people who thought the rules are out, you know, we can do what we want. And they rush in and they want to find Nancy Pelosi and tie her up. And they would if they can find her. Um, you know, that scares me because that is play, I guess. They were playing, but it's destructive and it's it's irrational and it's a mob rule. And that's, I think civilization is all about not, uh, not letting that happen. But that's interesting. Right. I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a really, really interesting point. How can we allow play like that while having a safe space? Is that even possible? So what are the ground rules for that kind of play? Where do you set the boundaries? And, um, and how can you ensure that um, there are some ground rules that, that aren't broken? <laughs> like, like, for example, having that every year shouldn't be broken because otherwise you lose the capacity for renewal. Um, so, so how is that negotiated in a healthy way? You have the rules for the infinite game and the rules for the finite game. The infinite game goes on forever. And it may be things like we're doing this every year. It may be things like do no harm, like the Sierra Club says, which is a pretty good infinite game rule. It may be um, things like compassion, uh, you know, values that we share that we don't ever breach. Uh, and then the other stuff is more, more prosaic. It's, you know, what we need to do to organize society, you know, stop at the red light and help your neighbor and that stuff. So maybe you're differentiating between fundamental values that we all share as a society that keep us, you know, human, and then other things that we organize freely and disorganize when, when they don't serve anymore. And maybe it's all about intention in a way, because when you just look at this um, carnival thing, then it's the intention is to have fun and break out the rules, which are just keep you inside a, like a cage or whatever. It's not to harm or not to throw over the current system or whatever. It's not a rebellion. It's just, yeah. You put have people in there that do have that intention. I mean, you have, I mean, that's what we had in, in the capital rights, or you have it in Kreuzberg on the 1st of May, where you have a couple of really hardcore people that want to really do damage. Not yeah. themselves, they're just demonstrating. And so then the whole thing gets ugly. How do you deal with that? How do you, how do you govern people like that? Fascinating question. Mm. <clears throat> so you're looking for a philosophical construct for your community. So a, a set mm. of values just like any company you know a mission statement all that stuff values and what do we stand for you know what is inviolable do you würde des mention is unantastbar is one of the most beautiful sentences ever written i think in constitutions um yeah so we all we all agree on that all 150 and then and that stays eternally or if anything's ever eternal and then we have a lot of other practical things that are negotiable 
mm -hmm. depending on who's at the table and what the world is doing and what we need and that we shift and change. And I mean, it sounds a lot like John Rawls, but a little more more up to date, you know, with the veil of ignorance. You know, you know, know I'm not familiar. John Rawls is a modern philosopher who picked up on Aristotle and he said, the question is, what is fair in society? How do you know something's fair? And he said, well, the way you know it is you do a thought experiment. You say, what if we were all, it was before existence and we were all around a table mm -hmm. and we knew we were going to be in the world, but we didn't know in what roles. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm going to be the father, you're going to be the boss, uh, you're going to be the poor person on the street, but we don't know who's who. And we would draw up rules as for our work together. The rules that we would draw up on that at that table without knowing who's who are fair rules mm -hmm. because because they're impartial mm -hmm. uh, and then you take that as a masthab for should i do this action or that action it's what what would we do behind the veil of ignorance when we didn't um it's a little bit like this i mean it's not as current and it's uh, very abstract but that's that's great i mean and and if you mix if you mix some of the ideas of the Athenian uh, democracy in there uh, um, about randomness, um, that could be, that could be a very interesting place, right? I'm putting so some just, of this in the chat, um, which you should save before we close because it'll yeah. disappear, you know. Um, what else did we have? The Harvard talk. Uh, notes. Um, Harvard, what is the good life all about relationships? And that's one of the top 10 TED Talks of all time, I'm told. So mm -hmm. it should be findable. Let me just see. Well, we're, I'll just do this on the side. If we do, and I'm going to put in. A good line, Harvard and relationships. Let's see if it comes up. Yes, it will. Robert Waldinger. Yep. Okay. Super. I'm going to give you the link. Doesn't sound familiar, but I'm yeah, watch it's it. worth watching. Copy and then. I guess I saw it. It's quite quite impressive. They did it for yeah, you know, as I yeah. said. Yeah, yeah, so they did it like really like a lifetime spans 50 years, as you said, or something. And it was actually a real study. It's not imaginary. They did it. No, no, they did it really, yeah, structured and so. And he came up with this idea like, okay, once you have like a, a, a rich relationship in where you live in and good friends, mm -hmm. then it makes it totally different. So how do you how do you do that in such a place? How do you create relationships? How do you... You need conditions that create that. I, I was wondering when you're talking about all these things in the models is once you have 150 people, the big difference, I guess, to all the things we are talking about now is you have your personal relationship to them. So you know each other. So you don't have to build up abstract. You do probably have, but it's not all about abstract things where you just have numbers of people around, like in a city or in a country. Mm -hmm. And you have to find ways how to make a society fair. So you have more like, yeah, you have a community of people know each other, knowing strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. and um, how to build up from that. And I just read a book about this old, like in the in indigenous wisdom from people, how, what can you learn from them? And they point out to a quite for me, interesting point that say it's all embedded in a bigger picture. So it's not about only you, but you are inside a big environment and like the Bibas are uh, like people as well, not only humans. And once you have like this mythology, like the big, big narrative, then everything, yeah, makes sense. And well, they get devoted to this. The, the Buddhist idea, I mean, there is no self. You yeah. don't exist really, there's only the world and all sentient beings. Yeah. And realize and that and a lot of the bad things go away exactly and they just come like the buddhism just come back to this very very easy rule to say like be like mindful to the each other and don't harm each other mm -hmm. and follow your karma so 
and Dharma. So and that's it's a quite simple set of rules in a way. Yeah, and it's so much more convincing than the Christian thing, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Buddhist faith, all these communities. Have you thought about religion in the in the connection with this stuff? I mean, is, what is the role of religion? I don't know. Tell us. I, I what, don't know. What would you think? What would you think? I think you need some kind of spiritual uh, um, component, mm -hmm. um, but I would hesitate. I would try to make sure that they don't start fighting because they're Christians and Jews and Arabs, um, is what we have now. How do you get a spiritual um, foundation that is that brings them together? Uh, and has that ever been done in history where you, people are not? I mean, you know Karen Armstrong? This is, I'm just giving you things I'm... Karen mm -hmm. Armstrong is, she is um, a former Episcopal nun who ran away um, and she's written all kinds of books about world religion. She's, she's an, a sort of a public intellectual and she, she um, got money from Ted to chart something called the Charter for Compassion. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you know this and they have a, a website um, I keep wanting to get involved with them, but I'm not completely convinced of what they're doing. But the idea is, she said, in every world religion, there is one unit that is always there, and that's compassion. And can we build on that? Can we start with that and skip all the other stuff, all the mythology and all the, you know, the Christ on the cross and the golden Buddha and all the other stuff that people need? But if we just go back to compassion, is that something we could all agree on? And so they, they build on that, and they do seminars and books and so on, but you know, this idea of again, ground rules, values, something bigger than us, something that we all respect. Yeah, uh, there's um, in, the, in the context of religion, uh, you probably have heard of Rene Girard. Hmm. I just came across him recently, and um, he has this idea of um, um, he's. He wasn't very religious, but um, because he had uh, he grew up in, in Christianity in France, he, he had to uh, somehow confront this at uh, at one point. So in, in the later portion of his life, he he mapped his ideas onto Christianity. That's why he usually is um, uh, known with uh, theologic. The How do you spell the name? Yeah. Girard, G I R A R D. Yeah. Girard? That's his name. Uh, René Girard. Si. René Girard. I don't know him at all. Interesting. Thank you. Um, so he has this idea. He says there's there's always this um, the, the tension between the subject and the model. So all of us are trying to model um, certain people or ideas. And the representation of the model is the object. So we want the SUV of our neighbor because we see our neighbor happy um, or rich or whatever. So we're trying to model our neighbor and we're trying to obtain the objects uh, of our neighbor um, to get closer to being that model. Mm -hmm. So the more homogenous and the closer the people, so the more, the more these models are your peers, the higher the probability for violence in, of any type. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we can we can easily be jealous, and then we can act on that jealousy, um, hit him with a club, steal the SUV, and um, and have the thing. Right? So essentially, um, communities, uh, um, ancient communities, um, dealt with that by scapegoating. So from time to time, they would um, chase out or kill somebody, and then um, that would serve as a as a pressure relief. Um, but of course that's not feasible after a while. So, so you could also put that into symbols. You can symbolically scapegoat and, um, and use that as a, as a um, pressure release valve, like the carnival in Cologne, for example. Um, but then you can also say that what, if, what would happen if that model um, was so far away that you can't achieve it? That's a king or a god or um, or a superstar um, that you aspire to, but you can never be in competition with that person or that that, that model. And um, so, it, it, what I what I had to think of when 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 I came across that was 
another book um, that I read a long, long time ago by uh, Bruno Bettelheim. Um, he was an anthropologist and in 1954, he wrote this book, uh, The Symbolic Wounds, about um, the, the, the um, uh, rites of passage for puberty in men and the envy of the men for the for the for the for women because when girls turn into women there's a physiological signal they start bleeding you can see that right boys don't have that okay. and that's that's his that's his core argument and and but there's yeah. anyway so there's there's a there's a description of um, of a of a rite of passage in somewhere in africa where the boys get sent into the jungle and they are only allowed to return once they have encountered their God and carved a representation of their God that will guide them for the rest of their life. Oh, so, Is that Maasai? It sounds very Maasai. I, I don't know. Can I don't remember. Um, I, 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 read it, I read it when I was 18. I mean, that's... Uh, mm -hmm long time ago so um but but the, the point is much like that magic circle that you were referring to um they are aware that this is a representation of something they came up with but still they're using it as a as a guiding principle and a model so the more het heterogeneous and the more outside your 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 models are the the more the higher the probability for um, less violence in your in your um, in your community, based yeah. on those principles, um, and if you then have a have a shared compass of um, where you want to go, so you can you can uh, collaborate around your shared compass while being extremely diverse, that might be a good um, balance. That, that presupposes education, Thomas. You need you need a basic level of education that everybody can think Why? like that. Why? You have Bubba in Arkansas that drinks beer and, and loves Donald Trump. What do you do with him? You know, he doesn't talk about these things. He doesn't hasn't read these books. He doesn't. How do you deal with that? How do you, deal if you with ritualize it in the same way? And if you if you send him into the jungle for forty days to live um, and survive by himself, and come back with his god, um, he might educate himself while he's mm -hmm. doing that. I don't know, but that's 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 a question. Mm -hmm. Could, could it be all in all like a playful approach on that? Like how to be playful in education or something? That would be mm -hmm. yep. a question in, in, in your direction because I guess you're the expert in this. Yeah, and that's, that's what my life's work is all about, you know, playing and teaching to play um, in seminars, but also beyond that, you know, it's, it's, it's unleashing that play, that play, uh, the, the power of play um, and you know you have cultures I know because I teach in many different cultures and you have a lot of cultures where like I taught a group of Armenians um, last year and they were just utterly thrown by what I do you know because I would call on them and I would ask them what they think and they were you know and it was on zoom and they wanted to turn the cameras off and not you know that they'd never heard of anyone that played in a seminar I mean it's it's sacrilegious you know you you listen to the teacher and then and you ask him what the answer is, and he tells you, and then you write it down, and then you remember it for the exam. You know, and but you have that in Germany too. I mean, it's you know we have to get rid of all of these, this rote learning. It's all about creativity and and coming up with it yourself. And but that's a big big job. And I don't know. I mean, in general, but but maybe something like that could be a principle in this new place with 150 people. So so how could look. A, a play look like where you can just build up from scratch a culture or something so how would you play this some kind of physical games some kind of you have to be creative with them i don't know what they would be not you know will you let people um, express themselves you know, physically and the, the big question is always does there need to be a winner or a loser that's one of the big questions or and people have found increasingly people love to play even without a winner and a loser it doesn't really matter um, you know, you don't need to have the, the, the world championship with one team wins and the others don't. Um, you know, it's people love to play. I mean, 
there are lots of apps now where, where I mean, there's an app for words with friends, which is uh, Scrabble really. And you do that and the whole point of that is just to have fun with it. You know, you don't, it doesn't really matter. Nobody really wins or it, 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 it's completely in the background. It just had the joy of finding a word and coming up with it and having points or, um, you know, that's fun. So it's, yeah, not everything has to be competitive is my point. It doesn't have to be win-lose. I, I think that's strong in people, but it's not the only thing. And if you can get past that and have them enjoy just the beauty of play or of dance or, you know, you know, connecting with people. Um, I always say negotiations like a dance. It's, it's not, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's, I make a move and you make a move and I make another move and we begin to dance and it's fun and it's beautiful. And, you know, Arab cultures know that because they do it at the, at the bazaar, um, you know, and, and there's a beauty in that, that um, it doesn't really matter who wins, you know. So that's yeah, they're insulted if you don't um, yeah. <laughs> negotiate with them. Yeah. So what? Yeah, that's true. So how do we create a society that's built on dance and and play? That would be my thought. Do you know of a way to? <clears throat> so if, if somebody's trained in a, in, a, in a society where people are focused on finite games, stacking mm -hmm. the results of finite games. Um, have you found a way of um, uh, helping them start to play infinite games or the infinite game? Well, if you can, in my little world that what I do, I mean, if you can create a safe space in a seminar through demonstration, I mean, I get away with a lot because I have gray hair and a tweed jacket and people think I'm serious because I used to be in business. So I can do wacky things and get away with it. So, it, but if you can, demonstrate that and gain their trust in a seminar that's more than three hours and then do funny things. They will go with you and they will discover how fun it is. I mean, I've seen the most amazing things. Um, you know, I, 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 I remember I taught at Deutsche Post, you know, 65 year old, uh, you know, Beamte um, who wanted to learn negotiation and, you know, with the gray hair and the Hornbrille and the, uh, and I had them pretending to be a diva um, you know, with sunglasses and, you know, uh, being emotional and trying to negotiate the Sally Swanson game that's quite well known at Harvard. And so they were negotiating the last role and they got into it like I've never seen anybody get into it. Uh, and they've completely lost their inhibitions, you know, because they knew it was, it was safe and we had confidentiality and nothing would ever happen. Mm -hmm. But I think when people feel safe and they let go of some of that, it, it just comes out. It's part of their, it's part of our DNA. Well, I've, I've seen similar things where um, I've, I've sent a, the whole board of directors of a, of a, um, a ducks company um, onto a time travel where I, ch I chased them around the room wearing helmets. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and yes, they lose their inhibitions and they start playing. But as soon as, the, as they get in the car and drive away from the place, yeah. all of that drops. It drops, but they so, don't forget. I think once you've had that experience, that inner experience, it, it, it opens up a new part of the human psyche, I think. And maybe they're, they're not going to be like that in the real world, but they will remember how that felt. And education is all about the inner experience. It's all about not just teaching you facts and figures, or, uh, but it's, it's changing the way you experience things in, internally. So, <clears throat> So in, in the ideal world of, of, of um, your community, somewhere in the outback, um, how would you um, ritualize that so, so that people um, drop back in regularly? You have a games master, like someone with credentials, someone that they respect, a shaman, if you put it. And then you have placed opportunities to play and people experience it and realize that they can go back to being in the society and with no consequences. And that's just as important as the food, frankly, I think, for the human experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a bit of an issue here. I, I do have another call in a little while. Um, you have other unanswered large questions that we've just sort of been free flowing and I love that. Well, not, not, not right now. We've been free flowing, as you say. Um, so, so if you have a call, then, then let's not stretch it. Um, but maybe we can do the following. If, you, um, if something 
like arises for you out of this conversation, um, then let's hop on to another one and, um, and continue with that. Um, we're not under no pressure, so, so we, can, we can just have this any, anytime, anywhere. I can um, you, if I think of something, I'll write it in an email and I mean, I will reflect on these things. It's an interesting beautiful. topic, I must say. And, you know, maybe I'll have the French call it l'esprit de l'escalier, the idea that you have on the stairway when you left the meeting, you think, oh, I should have thought of that. I should have mm -hmm, done that. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll think of something this afternoon that I should have said now and I'll write it to you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, any, any medium. Thank you so much. It's wonderful yes. to, 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 to meet you, Florian. And... I hope we'll continue the conversation. Yeah, I hope so also, because there are lots of things now on the playground. So I guess we, I, I would like to reach out to you because there might be some uh, projects together. Perfect. All right. So thank you. I'll thank say you.